So the AMD 7351 and the AMD 7371, those are epic processors, are entering wide availability. And they're new. They're not based on ROM, but they're pretty new. These epic CPUs were released at the end of 2018. And I've been using them, but until recently you couldn't get them on Newegg or Amazon or wherever. Now what sets them apart is that they are large cache and high clock speed epic CPUs. So no compromises on speed. According to an Anatech article, for their research, they're aimed at more uh, markets like uh, high frequency trading and certain types of simulation where high clock speed is favored over core count. But as a guy in the trenches, uh, let me tell you, it's a market disruptor. <laughs> These CPUs, the Epic 7371s, there's 16 cores, but across four dies, which means they've got 64 megs of L3 cache. They clock as high as 3.9 gigahertz, and the all core boost is 3.6, but I was seeing 3.7 on the Gigabyte R281 Z, uh, yeah, Z92. Now the 7351's a little slower, 2.4 gigahertz base and 2.9 gigahertz boost, but still that's no slouch for an epic CPU. Now let's talk for a second about our Gigabyte R281 Z92 chassis. This is a dual socket epic system. It has 16 memory slots per socket. It supports RDIM and LRDIM, it's registered memory, so that's up to four terabytes of memory capacity. There are five free PCIe expansion slots and most of the PCIe lanes go to the front I.O. Check out the block diagram here. This shows where all the PCIe lanes go. And as you can see, it's all NVMe. The server is built for massive I.O. It's ready with its 24 NVMe slots. And there's three groups of eight with I.O. So it's 16 lanes, 32 lanes, and then 16 lanes for each group of eight drives in terms of like bandwidth. It's also possible to configure the chassis to have 16 NVMe slots with the full 64 PCIe lanes for 16 of those or you know, eight SAS and there's some different chassis that Gigabyte offers. So in the real world, this configuration is pretty solid because you can mix drives that have lower latency like Optane with the, uh, you know, on the outer edges with the high throughput NAND flash drives in the middle because those are just hardwired into the CPU. And this is the same highly modular backplane approach that we saw from Gigabyte on the Cavium Thunder X2. And that approach worked really well there. It works just as well here in this chassis. So you can mix and match and do whatever you need. Now, of course, with all that PCIe connectivity going to the front, you know, that's going to occupy the OCP slots. It's all routed to the front, but you still have plenty of PCIe connectivity for 100 gig Mellanox adapters, multiple 100 gigs. Now I'm working on another project. I even installed a Tesla V100 GPU for virtualization. Uh, you need a special Epic heatsink if you're going to do that. That has a notch cut out of it. And technically the PCIe slots are full height half length, but you know, you can use X16 to X4 adapters for PCIe. You can do HHL PCIe storage, something like that. I've got liquids, new fast HHL. It's just, it's amazing. So the PCIe connectivity here is no problem. Saturating multiple 100 gig ethernet connections, all that kind of stuff, not a problem at all. Uh, yeah, technically using the Tesla V100 is out of spec, not recommended. So keep in mind that if you wanna use full length PCIe accessories, not really recommended for this chassis, you're gonna have to pick a different chassis. But how off label is it to use a Tesla V100 in this chassis? Well, the heat sinks get in the way. And so you'd have to use an aftermarket heat sink or uh, you know, notch out something in the heatsink. One other cool feature of this motherboard is that it does have four pin fan headers if you need to use a CPU heatsink that has active cooling. But you know, the, uh, the mid case, you know, standard issue rack mount fans that you have, I mean, this is a two U configuration rack mount server. Those work pretty well for cooling both the CPU and the V100. I really kept an eye on the V100 temperature and it was basically fine. Now on the other side, the heatsink blocks it quite a bit more and I had a little difficulty locating a, a uh, you know a TR4 cooler that would work on that side of the chassis but still provide adequate cooling for the uh, for the CPU so if you see one of those somewhere on the internet that would work well for my purposes even one that requires a fan let me know otherwise I'm gonna have to resort to like a 1U TR4 cooler don't really want to do that but you know again for Gigabyte they definitely do not recommend what I did with the V100, but for my use case, it worked fine. What the V100 does for me is in applications like VMware, I could run tons of virtual machines and share that one graphics card among several different virtual machines using NVIDIA's grid software. So if I've got, you know, an office full of, you know, 20 to 50 information workers that need to be able to run Adobe Photoshop and get a little bit of graphics acceleration, that V100 is gonna let me do that a lot better, a lot faster than a pure software virtual machine would let me do. It's basically a graphics card that supports hardware virtualization extensions. 
Now, in my case, I'm probably going to build gaming systems, so I could probably get four to eight decent sets of gaming experiences off of the one Tesla V100, and of course you can add more than one V100 to a system as well. They're also great for machine learning, you know, packing that in and doing machine learning and floating point operations and stuff like that. Like, you can kind of see that from the uh, high performance computing benchmarks in this is like, you know, the other comparison systems in the Pharaonic benchmark is, you know, sometimes less than one million operations per second. And with the GPU, it's more like 50 to 60. So I mean, those GPUs are pretty cool. Also at the back, we've got two more 2.5 inch bays. Those are hooked up to the onboard SATA, but you can hook them up to SAS or you know other stuff like that if you want to, if you, get, if you add, do an add-in controller. Now for the testing that we're doing, we're using uh, 280 gig Intel Optane drives. So, and this thing is, it's, it's mind blowing. Let's take a look at the benchmarks. So we use the Pharonix test suite on CentOS for doing all of the testing and the link to that is in the description so you can go check that out. Now first up, we can compile the Linux kernel in 28.81 seconds. That's without even breaking a sweat. So for the rest of the tests, I wanted to do the comparison with the Xeon Gold 6138. These CPUs retail for way more than the 7371s. I also wanted to test NUMA and UMA unified memory access, so I strongly recommend uh, eight sticks of memory per socket as a result of that testing. Now the temptation is to get one or two sticks of memory per CPU because it's cheaper and uh, don't do that. Just trust me, check out the benchmarks. Uh, if you do eight sticks of memory per socket, you can run UMA. So here's the topology with NUMA. Eight nodes in the system with varying distances depending on if it's a local or remote node. A lot of software has not caught up to this type of a topology to be able to work optimally in this config. There's nothing wrong with it, and you'd be hard pressed to find a better CPU for the money, but if you have eight sticks of memory and your app is not super latency sensitive, a two node topology is gonna to be way less headache and generally faster than an eight node topology. So you turn on, uh, you know, die interleaving in BIOS and you get two NUMA nodes instead of eight. Now fortunately, this is something that you can experiment with, and so you should, in order to find the best optimal combo whatever for your thing. Now for the high performance computing benchmarks, I tried to make sure it was not using the GPU, but I'm not really sure how successful I was with that, given the benchmark results. For NAS Parallel EP.C, well, those tests were within 3% of the dual Xeon Gold 6138, competing CPUs with a considerably higher MSRP of about $2,600 each. These are an MSRP of about $1,500. Now for most of the tests, these benchmarks show that the AMD CPUs are within a few percentage points of the Intel Xeon 6138. And in some, these, these CPUs are absolutely shredding. Things like open SSL signing, which is typically an Intel dominated operation, uh, you know, it was in, within a few percentage points. Apache and PHP bench were basically neck and neck. The things that uh, could leverage the relatively huge cache for 16 cores, things like the HMMER search, stuff like that, that was three times faster than the Xeon Gold equivalent. And that is super, super impressive for this platform. So I really think, I mean, be sure to check out the full benchmarks. Come discuss with us in the forum at level one because uh, the 7371 is sort of mind blowing. I've also done a breakdown of the IOMMU groups, which are very solid as well. Uh, but we need to have a separate discussion on VMware and virtualization and that sort of stuff on the AMD platform. Look, Gigabyte is really putting a lot of work into upping their game with servers, and these are solid, a great value. Uh, you know, there's nothing proprietary here. I'm building something exciting, you know, 10 Raspberry Pis, one server or two servers, a cluster, I don't know. We'll see. And this is going to be at the heart of this thing that I'm building. So Gigabyte's really up their game, but I wanted to take a moment to be like, wow, these 7371s, I mean, they're affordable CPUs, but they're unexpectedly fast and unexpectedly inexpensive. I mean, 16 cores, that price point, certain things happen in licensing with like Windows Server 19 and SQL Server and stuff like that, because it's like, ooh, 16 cores, you know, you got the affordable pricing, but the high clock speed here, the high clock speed is really a winning combination for you know mediums like not like super enterprise like Facebook where it's like oh we must have we must have the optimal point on the curve for uh, you know density and power usage small business it's like I want a fast snappy server and I don't want to spend five thousand dollars per CPU uh, the 7371 you would hard be hard pressed to find a better alternative to that CPU I mean it is a shockingly impressive server grade CPU, especially when you consider chassis like the Gigabyte chassis where you can get four terabytes of memory. That makes a lot of problems go away. I mean, it really, it does. 
So I'm looking forward to doing a couple of more applications with this server and see how the performance goes. Now, if you, if you want to save a few hundred bucks, you can go for the 7351, but in my opinion, the cost delta, go for the 7371, and make sure you go for 8.6 of memory. That is critically important. Check out the benchmarks, or we can discuss, maybe that'll be an interesting follow-up video, because I've seen some people say that 4.6 of memory per socket is okay, and that is actually in the AMD documentation, but for most things that you would run, 8.6 of memory per socket. So, that may be something that's improved upon in Rome with the, uh, you know, the IO die and some of the other stuff, but that's a conversation for another day. I'm Wendell. This is Level 1. I'm signing out, and you can find me in the forums at forum.level1text.com. See you there.